My name is Dan Gilbert. I'm a sociology professor here and the chair of BCC's Multicultural Committee. And this event is the last of a series of events this semester. Uh, the topic is the crisis of economic inequality in the United States. I think everybody here knows that what's been happening just from what you see around you and your own experiences. The rich are getting richer, the middle class is getting squeezed and pushed down, and the poor are getting poor. And we have a speaker here who is uniquely uh, qualified to speak to this issue, both based on knowledge and based on uh, his involvement as an activist working for social change. He's been active in movements for change around the issues of economic justice uh, for a little over 30 years. Uh, he's now the political director of SEIU, Service Employees International Union in Massachusetts. And he's somebody that I've worked closely with and very close friends with for the last almost 20 years. So let me introduce Harris Grumman. Um, he's going to be speaking, but also there's going to be time for discussion and questions. If you have any questions you want to ask, please jot them down. And we have a mobile <laughs> mic that we can pass around so people can ask the questions. So there'll be a dialogue as well as hearing Harris's presentation. Also, the evaluation form that almost hopefully all of you got, please pass that in at the end of the talk. We will be ending um, at the correct time, so you're not <coughs> worrying about getting up and leaving uh, at a quarter, quarter to 11, uh, the presentation will end. So let me introduce Harris Grumman. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> My voice sounds a little weak. It's uh, got a bronchitis I'm getting over, but uh, usually it's, it's too loud, if anything. So uh, this will make it normal. But um, the Service Employees International Union, uh, just so you know what organization I'm with, is, is the largest and most uh, rapidly growing union in the United States. Uh, a trade union is you know, when workers come together to make their voice stronger at work, you know, and be able to ask for things like fair wages, fair benefits, and uh, fair treatment and a voice at the job. And so uh, it's as simple as that, really, what a union is. But the Service Employees International Union is growing because of the kind of workers we represent. Uh, we represent people in growing areas of the economy, mostly like health care and social services. So we have 65,000 members in Massachusetts. And most of them work for Medicaid as personal care attendants or hospital orderlies. And uh, a lot work as social workers. Some of you might be in social work, uh, that you might end up being a member of SDIU if you work in Massachusetts in social work. Uh, and a lot of them work in uh, really low wage jobs for big business, like cleaning offices or being security guards at banks and ATM machines. So these are people whose jobs can't be sent overseas. They, they have to, we need those jobs right here. And the danger is we will exploit those workers because they are very, uh, those jobs are considered low skill. But if you've ever taken care of an elderly or disabled person or somebody in need and as a social worker, you know that's not a low skilled job. Even, even being a cleaner or guarding an ATM machine at two in the morning is not a low skilled job. You have to be alert. You have to be on the job, and you have to work very, very hard. So we're about making sure those workers are treated the way people deserve to be treated, which is they have a living wage and economic security, and they can retire with security. So it's a different image of unions than you might have as a stereotype, right? I mean, even looking at me, I might not be the best representative of the union because I'm a political director, so I have a different background in education. But um, also, our union is not full of, you know, big, tough white guys with hard hats with patches of the union on it. Uh, those are unions, too. But most of our members are people who you would recognize as struggling to get by in uh, the inner city. And so I'm just going to pass around a couple of leaflets from our Springfield work so you get a sense of, you know, what our stuff looks like and what the people look like and what they talk about uh, while I'm talking. So I just want to pass a couple of these up uh, and you can just look at it while I'm talking but um, I'm here to talk today about the crisis of economic inequality in America it really is a crisis uh, before I was invited there was no I mean or when I was invited there was no Occupy Wall Street how many people here have heard of Occupy Wall Street 
Okay, there's this you know, movement of people who just took over a park near Wall Street to protest uh, the economic inequality in America. And it's happened now in Boston and you know, Harvard University and towns all across America, even in Iowa and places. People are occupying parks and city halls and things to get this point across. Now, they have one basic slogan they've been trying to get across. Has anybody heard what they like, how they define what they're about? Who are they for? Have you heard anything about that? Who are they? Who do they say they are? The 99%. Very good. They say we're the 99%. That means there's a 1% that is the problem they're talking about. So let's start there. I mean, what is economic inequality in America today? Uh, one way to measure it is by looking at what the top 1% have of our economy. Now, I'm going to take this with me. I want to just show on the board here. First, though, I'll make a circle and let's get a, a sense of what 1% is. Well, 1% is 1 one hundredth of the American population. Now, if you ever tried to cut a pie into 100 pieces, that would be uh, kind of hard to serve, you know? Uh, so it's a little sliver like, like this, maybe, right? Okay, that's the pie chart of the top 1%, the little sliver there. So how much of the income that's made every year do they make? Does anybody know that? Well, they don't make 99% of the income, but they, just this sliver, make a full 25% of all income every year, okay? They earn 25% of all the income in America goes to that little sliver, okay? That's income. What about wealth, though? Wealth is not income. You know, wealth is what you own, okay? Like stocks and bonds, houses, cars, all those things. That's your wealth. What percent of the wealth do the top 1% have? Does anybody know that? Well, it's not that high either, you guys. I mean, it will get there. I mean, both these answers are the danger, right? Could get like that. If it got like that, though, you know, I don't know what this country would look like. It would probably look like uh, something really terrifying. Uh, it looks bad enough now. But they have basically 40%, okay, almost half of the wealth. Now, you know, when people talk about that and they say, oh, look, you know, they have all this, I mean, I kind of go blank myself sometimes. They have the top 1% of 25, 35, 90, you know, you tell me, right? I mean, these are numbers. Uh, the question is, is this always been true, right? I mean, what if it's always been true? I mean, that, wouldn't, that would mean it isn't a crisis. It's just always been like that. So, I mean, let's go back 30 years uh, or 25, you know, like back when I started being active. How much of the income did the top 1% get 25 years ago? And it turns out it's half that. It's 12%, okay? So that's a big difference. That's half what it is today in terms of how much income they take in. Now, the wealth is a little more interesting. It wasn't that different. It was 33%, basically a third, okay? So that's not as different. And that, I'll get back to that later. There's an interesting uh, thing to think about with that. That's actually very important for when people think that uh, Occupy Wall Street wants to, uh, you know, like take over the rich or eliminate the rich. Uh, I think that's uh, a misconception that this helps explain this difference versus this difference. Okay? So, I mean, that is the the amount of inequality we're dealing with, because that means as you go down the economic ladder, you get more and more people and less and less income and less and less wealth that those people have, until you get a huge number of people who actually have negative wealth. Almost 50% of Americans are in debt. Through their mortgage, through their credit cards, through their student loans, they actually own less than zero dollars in wealth, okay? That's quite a contrast with these folks who own 40% of the entire wealth of the nation and they're that tiny little sliver there. So um, one of the questions, when, was, when has it been this, I mean if, if 25 years ago it was like this, when was it ever in this country as unequal as it is now? 
How far back do you have to go to get to that level of inequality? Does anybody have an idea about that? What years that might be? Yeah, the 1920s, actually. Go back to 1929. Let's go back to 1929. This is what it looks like, you know, in 2011. And you have to go back to 1929 to get the same level of inequality, 25% of the income, 40% of the wealth. Okay, that's a long time ago. And um, I guess one of the questions is why why should we care about that? Is there anybody here who's worried about this level of inequality? Anybody angry about it? Okay, why? Why angry? That's not fair. <laughs> okay, it's not fair. Why worried about it? You here worried about it? Because historically, when it starts getting in balance, the economy goes to hell. Okay, well, that's the point, because what happened in 1929? Yeah, the Great Depression started. The stock market crashed that caused the Great Depression. Now, we're in a bad economic uh, crisis right now, right? I mean, we have 9% unemployment. We've had it more or less since 2008, since the fall of 2008. And uh, in the Great Depression, it was much worse than that. It went as high almost as 20% unemployment. And, uh, you know, if you can imagine what that's like. So that's how bad it can get. So the level of inequality we have today is like the level of inequality that led to that Great Depression. And in fact, a lot of people would argue we would not be in this kind of, this is the most serious economic crisis we've had since 1929, you know, since the Great Depression ended in the 30s. And we uh, were back to that because of the inequality. Now, you might say, why, why is that? What is, why does inequality lead to economic crisis? It's because if all the money is up here, you know, if the money starts to get all up to this tiny sliver of people, what do the rest of the people have to buy things with? In other words, the economy thrives on producing things that people then buy. That stabilizes the economy. The less people have to buy things, if they're just buying with credit cards and eventually they can't afford to even do that or nobody will loan them any more money, then you get this problem where the rich have the money to invest, but they can't invest it profitably in selling to regular folks. They can only make a profit by investing in games with money. You know what I mean? Like where you sell short, as they call it on the stock market. You buy someone else's stocks and wait till they change and then sell them and you make a quick profit on it. And there's all this gaming going on in the stock market that eventually somebody says, hey, is there any real money back in that up? You know, everything's getting more and more inflated. People are gambling on ideas about how to make money off of money. And then when they call in the money, there is no money. So suddenly everybody backs off. That's what happened in 2008. And whole banks went bust overnight. You know, Lehman Brothers annihilated overnight because they didn't have real productive investments behind this stuff. It was all speculation in real estate, speculation in money transactions. And that's what happened in 1929 too. People were poor. I mean, our, our, your great grandparents, my grandparents, you know, a lot of them started out in tenements, cold water tenements, you know, really lived, most people were poor. And so suddenly people were making all this money in the stock market through the roaring 20s and it turned out they were making money on money. And then people said, oh, wait, where's the real money? And then everybody's like, bust, you know? And so that brought the economy down in a big way. Uh, and that's what's happening again. So when you don't have a strong middle class, a strong middle class that can afford to buy things and buy goods and services, buy even education, right? That's a, that's a service. Uh, then you've got a problem with your economy. So I mean, even if we're not angry, about fairness, we should be scared about the economic future, the stability of our economy. So there are a lot of reasons to be worried about this. There's also uh, worries about democracies. Democracies usually have a high level of equality. Uh, countries that don't have good equality, a very high inequality, often become dictatorships because they power is too concentrated. You know, so I mean, we don't want to move in that direction. But even if you're not afraid about democracy or you're not afraid about fairness, 
we should always be afraid about the economy because we know what that looks like. The 30s was a hard time. So the question then is why is inequality growing? I mean, okay, it is growing. So why? Why did that happen? Does anybody have an idea why that happened? So human nature's changed. People used to be good, now they're not good? Okay, yeah, I mean, I, maybe I'm more cynical than you are. I think people, people who were greedy always were greedy. I mean, but, but there were regulations. Mm -hmm. What's the worst? Well, I mean, I guess you look at that is if you reward greed, right, then people who have a tendency that way say, okay, well, <laughs> if I'm greedy, I gain. So, uh, yes, in that way, you're right. I don't think human nature's changed, but I do think that uh, we can speak to people's better instincts, right, their, their better side, or we can speak to their worst side and say, let the strong win, you know, let those who aren't greedy lose. Population growth in the U.S., there's less people with more, less money, so the balance goes off too. Well, it's still a percent about. One percent is one percent, whether it's one percent of a million or one percent of 300 million. They're given more power, and mm -hmm. they're getting more loopholes around the rules? Yes, well, these rules uh, and things that you're talking about, I, I want to get to that. I mean, one thing that you hear in the news all the time that might lead you to think the cause was that the country itself is somehow getting poorer, right? I mean, what's that super committee trying to deal with? You heard about the super committee in Congress? What's their job, supposedly? Well, not necessarily to cut taxes. Some of them want to cut taxes, but what is their, what do they have to solve, supposedly? Deficits, debt, right? That's what we hear over and over again. The country is in debt. The country's in deficit. And people are in debt and in deficit, right? Credit card debt, as I said, 50% of people are in debt. So you say, boy, the country's getting poor. I guess that's why inequality is getting worse. There's less to go around. So. Just to, to clarify that, if we take 1950 and today, there's two lines there, uh, which I would call the prosperity lines. One is productivity. Is our nation able to produce more per worker now than we were in 1950? What? Really? Actually, the productivity line, if you think of productivity, goes up like this, okay? Now, it doesn't, it goes a little bit like this, right? But I mean, you get the idea. It's going up, up, up. From the 1950 to today, it's basically the productivity per worker in America because of mechanization and everything and computers and all these devices is very good. And what about wealth, overall wealth? The overall wealth, like the total amount of wealth in the nation. Has that gone up from 1950? No, actually wealth too has gone up like this. Now again, you know, there are bumps in the road. 2008 is kind of a big bump in the road, right? But it doesn't derail the trend. Overall wealth has gone up. I mean, we say in 1950 we could afford Social Security. Today, <laughs> We can't afford Social Security, even though the overall wealth of the nation has gone up. I mean, that's kind of a peculiar situation. So something has changed from 1950 today, and it's a different line, which I would call the shared prosperity, okay? That's what's changed since 1950. In 1950, when productivity and wealth went up, everybody's share went up, generally speaking. I mean, took some things like the civil rights movement, some of you I think will agree to make sure that happened for everybody. I mean, we had to make some changes. Femi the feminist movement helped make sure women benefited equally, and uh, you know, they still don't benefit equally. But in those days, generally things were going up. And what happened was, at a certain point, the shared prosperity doesn't follow it anymore. Wealth goes up, productivity goes up, but it isn't shared 
across the nation, isn't shared across the population. So that gets down to a very basic problem. I mean, if you want less inequality, there has to be a way to share the wealth of society. Whatever you think the cause, you know, the source of the wealth is, if you want less inequality, there has to be a way to share that wealth. Now, there are two basic ways to share the wealth. Uh, do you know what those would be? What are the two basic ways people have used to make sure wealth is shared? Why was it shared much more equally in 1950, 1960, even 1970, but not afterwards? What was different? You said regulations and things. That, that's part of it, but what are the big things that share the wealth? Taxes, how you tax people. Progressive taxes, and do people understand what I mean by progressive taxes as opposed to just taxes? What's a progressive tax? <coughs> right, so like, okay, for example, uh, if I say the way I tax people the way people were taxed like 200 years ago, I say, okay, you, I'm gonna charge $1,000 a year in taxes, okay? and the richest guy in the country, I'm going to charge $1,000 in taxes. Does that $1,000 hurt you more than it hurts him? Yeah, so that's a, what we call a regressive tax. That like is the opposite of making things more equal. Then you get to a tax that's like the Massachusetts state income tax. It's a percent. So I say, okay, you're going to pay 10% of your income and the richest person is going to pay 10% of their income. Well, that means they pay a lot more, right, than you do, but it's no more of their income. Now, is that fair, too? What if you're making uh, $20,000 a year and you pay 10% and somebody else is making a million dollars a year and paying 10%? Is it the same for both of them? Is that, like, the same? Why isn't it the same? million. That's what, 100,000? 100, 100, and they'll still have 900,000 left. Right. And can you live on $900,000 a year? <laughs> can you live on 18,000 with a family of four? I mean, you know, it, it, it's very different. So that's why we have had, since a certain period, we've had progressive taxes, which say you pay 10% if you're earning lower income, maybe even less than that. And then at the highest incomes, you pay more, okay, 30% or something, right? That's about what it is now. It's a little less than that, 30% for the highest incomes. But it still leaves you with a lot of money if you're rich and not so much if you're poor, but at least you're making it progressive. That's a way to share the wealth. That's one way to fix this natural tendency for the wealth to go up and the inequality to go up at the same time. The other way, I mean, you said taxes, is there another major way that you can share the wealth? What? Well, charity, but that's very hit or miss. You know, it's certainly a good thing, but it, it has never proven. I mean, in the Middle Ages, they had a lot of charity, but the poor stayed poor and the rich stayed very rich. You know, I mean, it was not a systematic way of fixing the problem. The, the way, and this is, sorry, the way, uh, I would, you know, I, I work on, you see, is a, is a union, right? How does a union, a trade union, a labor union, help share the wealth? What do they do? They increase wages, and they increase wages by saying the employer has X amount of money. We deserve a bigger share of it. Why do they deserve a bigger share? Why would they deserve any share? They're doing the work, right? So they, now, you know, there's going to be a fight back and forth about who deserves more, but that's why it's a negotiation. It's called collective bargaining, where all the workers get together and they sit across the table from the boss or the employer and say, we want more. And the employer says, but there isn't more. Or my shareholders need more. And they say, yeah, but we need more to live and we're producing better. Our productivity went up and you're paying us the same as if our productivity was the same, and so on and so forth, right? Well, that means in the end of that negotiation, more money goes to the workers than would have gone to them otherwise. So those are the big things. 
progressive taxes and unions. And there's something really different about those two things that's worth noticing, and this is important for the situation we're in right now. Taxes happens through what? Who, who does, who collects the taxes and, and uh, uses them? Government. Government collects the taxes and then uses them for programs like this college here, right? This is paid for with taxes, with progressive taxes, relatively progressive taxes, and financial aid. Anybody who's here on financial aid, that comes from progressive taxes. That's using the money of people who can afford to pay taxes to help people who can't afford to go to college, go to college at a cheaper college with financial aid maybe, and then get a better job and then be able to actually make more income, not less income, right? That's, that's an example of progressive taxes at work. That's how it shares the wealth. It takes more from the wealthy and gives to programs that help people. Unions, though, traditionally don't work through the government. Unions happen outside the government and offline of taxes. It's a whole different strategy. It's where workers sit down across from a big corporation, like Walmart, if they had a union, they could say, you're making so much profit, give some of it back to us. There's no taxation, there's no government in between. It's, it's what they call civil society. It's just people getting together and demanding more from private companies, okay? So you could say, well, I like that better than that or I like that better than that. It doesn't matter. The point is a balanced society uses both of those strategies. And the balanced society started when? I mean, when did progressive taxes really start in this country in a big way? When did unions really take off in this country? The end of World War II. Yeah, well, end of World War II is when it got really good, but it really started because of decisions made right before World War II, which is what they call the New Deal. Franklin Roosevelt, you know, the majority that came in during the Depression, they actually created progressive taxes and you know, allowed unions to form in a new way. And that really is the genius of the New Deal. They didn't do one and not the other because if they'd gone all with taxation and pro government programs, they would have been attacked, like Obama's been attacked ridiculously, as too socialist for this country. Uh, if they'd only done the union thing, it probably wouldn't have been enough and it also, you know, would have been uh, one-sided that way. Employers would have said, we're you know, under a massive attack in the workplace and uh, you know, we can't afford to solve all the country's problems. Some of them don't happen in my workplace. You know, they happen in the society at large. So the genius of the New Deal was to start big progressive taxation to fund things that we now take for granted, like Social Security started then and the Federal Housing Administration to help people buy homes and stay in their homes. And they also did huge public works, right? Something we haven't even begun to do about this recession. They just said if you're a, you know, a low income person in the city or in the countryside and you don't have a job, we'll give you a job. There's work to do. We'll you know, build a plumbing system for this city. We'll electrify this countryside. We'll repair the roads. We'll build the national parks. We'll put people to work because when they're working, they spend money. And when they spend money, businesses do better and the economy does better. So they use progressive taxation even to give people outright jobs with 17, 18% unemployment going on. And that really, there's a date there that's very key and that's 1935, okay? That's when the New Deal really took off. That's when they had a big enough majority in Congress that they could do big things, and the people were so upset by the, you know, you know how upset people are right now with 9% unemployment. Think how we'd all be when it gets to 17% or 18% unemployment. They had to do something or the country was going to come apart at the seams. So they did what we then took for granted for years afterwards, which is progressive taxation to fund public programs like BCC, and give unions the right to organize, because before then, if you tried to organize a union, what did your boss do? Fired you. Fired you. And they said, that's illegal. 
people have the freedom to associate in the workplace and work together in the workplace to get better wages and benefits. They made that a law. It's been the law of the land, the National Labor Relations Act, since 1935. And it had a huge impact then on what happened. I mean, unionization went up by millions. First went up about five million from 1935 to the war, and then as you said, after the war, it went up another five million. 10 million people joined unions in a, over a course of uh, 10 years, less than 10 years. And it had a huge impact on the world after that. Because from 1935 then till 1973, how many of you were born after 1973? <laughs> okay, that, that is a turning point in history, okay? That is the most important turning point in history. I, I know, you know, certainly the most important turning point in my lifetime. 1950 to 1973, you have high unionization, high progressive taxes, and greater and greater equality. Okay? 1973 till today, you have decreasing unionization, you have decreasing progressive taxes, decreasing overall taxes, and decreasing progressive taxes. The Bush tax cuts recent, not that long ago, right? About uh, less than 10 years ago, cut taxes dramatically for wealthy people, for the wealthiest people. And you have greater and greater inequality because of that. Now, so I get these calls in my office from time to time from people who are with the uh, so-called uh, Tea Party, okay? <laughs> they watch Fox News and Glenn Beck comes on and he says, call these people up, they're, they're ruining this country, give them a piece of your mind. And so I get these angry calls from time to time. I don't know exactly where they get my number from. And they say, what's the matter with you people in the unions? You know, you're really, there's too many people in unions. Unions have too much power. There's too high taxes. We tax people too much. And I say, gee, that's, that's interesting. Because almost all these callers, by the way, they sound, you know, maybe I'm stereotyping. They sound like they're about my age, OK? So I say to them, um, gee, uh, you know, in 1959, I, I was born in 1959, I say, you know, I don't know about you, but I mean, I was born in 1959, and I, would you say that was a more prosperous, optimistic time than today? And they always say, absolutely, yes, the good old days, that's when things were right in this country. I say, okay, no, I, I feel the same way about it. I grew up in a very optimistic time. People felt they were going to do better than their parents. Everybody was very optimistic. So do you want to know something about that time? 35% of workers were in unions. Only 10% are in unions today. And the top tax rate on the richest people was 91%. Okay, 91%. I just said, what did I say the top rate is today? It's about 30. It was 91%, okay? And people say, 91%, that's crazy, right? Now, that means they don't pay 91% on the first $200,000, $300,000. They pay what somebody would pay at that rate. But above that, like money they make over half a million dollars, they give 91% of it. That really is like the opposite of that slip. They give 91% had to go back to the government. People said, gee, that, that must have like, eliminated the rich, right? There were no rich people then in 1959, I assume. The answer is no, there were plenty of rich people. They owned wealth. They owned almost as much wealth as they own today. They were on yachts. They were having their conspicuous consumption. They were having the good life, uh, just like the rich have it today. But that income was taxed at a rate that we can't even imagine now. So I tell them that, these angry people about taxes and unions, and they don't have anything to say back to me. Because they know that has to be true. I mean, they can check it out themselves. And then they've got kind of a problem, right? Because if the problem is too many people in unions and too high taxes, then why are they so dissatisfied with the country today? It's much better, according to them. Things should be great, right? So do you have any uh, questions at this point? I mean, uh, I've been putting a lot of stuff out of me. I'm wondering if people, do you have any questions you want to clarify about what I said or anything? Service Employees International Union. 
service employees because they're people who don't work in like manufacturing jobs, building cars and stuff, but they work in services like hospitals, uh, social, social services, uh, but also like cleaning services or security services, you know, all the things that have become bigger in this economy over the last 30 years rather than smaller. So a lot of them very low paid jobs too, uh, and the union helps them get at least more wages and often some benefits like a health care benefit. Okay, well, I wanted to then say something about the labor movement because that's where I work and I chose to work there because I do think it's incredibly important to all this. Um, the labor movement uh, is in what I would call a kind of a crisis. It's a, you know, you could actually speak about the rise and decline of the labor movement. And unfortunately, uh, whatever you think of the labor movement, that also is the history of the rise and decline of the great American middle class. Okay. Uh, does anybody know what this geological formation is called out west? When you see something like that, like a kind of a mountain that's flat on top? Plateau. Well, plateau's really big, covers a lot of ground. What if you just see sort of like the size of a, you know, a mountain, but it's flat on top? A mesa, right. So I, I call it, I was out west working for the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, so I got used to this, seeing these things. Um, when I mentioned it to Dan, he was like, people don't know what a mesa is in Massachusetts. Some of you have seen, you know, pictures or watched a western or something. But anyway, I call it a mesa because that's what the labor movement's history sort of looks like in uh, you know, the last, since 1935. I, I put 1935 here. There were unions before 1935, but they were much smaller. And 1935 was the National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, it was called after Senator Wagner, who promoted it. And uh, it was passed, and it basically said, if a majority of people at a workplace want a union, they have it and they can then negotiate with the boss, and the boss has to negotiate with them. And that caused all these workplaces across the country to unionize, because they'd already been protesting. They'd been you know, doing sit-down strikes and complaining about the fact that because so many people were out of work, people were cutting what few people had good jobs. They were losing everything. They were losing their wages, their benefits. Life was getting worse, and instead they said, no, it's got to be better than that. We've got to fight back, and we need more of the wages, you know, more of the profits, so we can make the economy strong. I mean, they understood that that was necessary. So in 1935, they gave them that right, and they started organizing shops that had never been organized before. Low-skilled workers in big assembly line factories started organizing by the millions. And African Americans were brought into unions for the first time by hundreds of thousands. And it really was changing everything about America until after the war and right during the war and right after the war it really had a big upsurge all these GIs were coming back from the war the economy was doing better now and people came back joined a union right so millions more were joining in 1946 the union movement tried to do something very revolutionary which was to there was one place where there weren't many unions and that was the deep south anybody have an idea why there weren't unions in the deep south Racism, pure and simple. The people who controlled things were white, and they told poor whites, don't organize together with African Americans, organize you know, with us, be with us. We'll give you little perks, we'll let you have little special treatment, and you'll feel better than somebody. And the union movement, the AFL-CIO, but at that time it was mainly the CIO it was called, that was the big new union, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, did something called Operation Dixie, where they said, we're going to go in and we're going to organize the South. That means we're going to organize mostly African Americans into unions. Okay? That's powerful stuff, because in the North when it happened, I mean, there was a, a, a guy, I, I one time read a quote in 1936, an African American union member, they said, what's different about, you know, like, what, what has the union done for you? And he said, well, I'll give you an example. 
My boss walked by and he said, hey boy, how do you like that 10 cent raise I gave you last week? And I said to him, I don't know, I'll take it up with my committee. What would have happened to him in 1934 if he had said that to his boss? Yeah, he'd have been lucky if he wasn't beaten on the way out the door. He said, that I have power because I'm with other people. And so when they were going into Operation Dixie in 1946, they struck terror into the hearts of Southerners, Southern whites, and something happened that reversed a lot of the good of the uh, Wagner Act, and that was the Southern Democrats broke with the Northern Democrats and sided with the Republicans against unions and passed in 1947, they amended the National Labor Relations Act with a bill called the Taft-Hartley Act, which you'll hear about. This is extremely important what this did. It basically caused the growth of unions to flatten and you know, the South never was very unionized as a result. And it became very hard to advance the labor movement. It didn't become impossible to maintain it. It was maintained at that level, like 35%. But they couldn't grow anymore. And why? They did little things, very sneaky things, really. I, I know this as a union uh, organizer. Uh, they said foremen couldn't be in unions anymore. Now that's like, well, foremen, unions, maybe they should be with the management. Maybe foremen had incredible power to make the union strong and organize the union. On a shop floor, let's say I'm looking out over, you're all working at, at, uh, at you know, textile machines, right? And I'm the foreman looking out over you. And what they would do is one of you would raise their hand like, I got a problem, right? I'm being mistreated. Some, they're violating my union rule. I take out my whistle blow the whistle, and you all stop working. The manager walk in and say, what's going on? I say, we're on strike until you fix that man's problem. I mean, that's power, right? You don't treat any of us that way. We're together. You take that foreman out and put him on the side of the manager. Who's going to stop the work for all these people? Who's going to have the power to do that? So they took away, in a funny way, like the officer corps, <laughs> of the union that way. And the other officer corps they took away was, I mean, you've heard of McCarthyism. You know, the, during the Cold War, there was this anti-communist, anti-socialist uh, sentiment that grew because of the struggle with the Soviet Union. Uh, one of the negative effects was the CIO was led by a man named John Lewis, who was actually a registered Republican. But he was a very a clever uh, fighter. And he said, who are the best troops to organize people? that are communists and socialists, <laughs> they, they really believe in this stuff. So I hire them. I don't agree with them. I hire them and I make them organize. And they organize really, really well. And then the people are in my union, which is run like an American union. But I couldn't do it without them. So I hire them and put them to work. The Taft-Hartley Act said everyone had to go through a uh, process if they were a socialist or a communist. They could not work for a union anymore. That was another way of taking out another officer core of the union movement. Basically, they were very subtly taking out the shock troops of the union movement, the foremen and the organizers. So that's why things flattened out. You could, it was got hard to bring people into unions. And then, of course, they limited striking and all kinds of things that made people feel powerful and made it much more like a backroom deal kind of process. You just have to negotiate. You, you have a business agent. He goes in and negotiates with the manager. And so it worked, but growth stopped. So that was OK until basically, again, we get to 1973, that date again. 1973 is a very strange economic crisis. It's not like 1929, and it's not like 2008. But it was an economic crisis that was very uh, severe. It was an international globalization crisis. For the first time, America was losing all its industry to other countries and letting that happen. I mean, we, we didn't control those things. We didn't try to hold on to our manufacturing like Germany has, for example. Uh, we let it go. You know, go where the money's the uh, highest profit. That process was undermining a lot of unions, because if an auto plant is unionized and they all go over to Korea, 
that's not, <laughs> those workers are out of work, right? And they're all union workers. So all of a sudden, union workers are losing their jobs and they're kind of on the ropes. And the employers went on the offensive, starting, you know, already in 1970, the employers started organizing themselves to change this country. And they were very explicit. They were going to undo the New Deal. They were going to undo everything about the New Deal. Unions, progressive taxes, and public programs. They were going to take it back. They were going to take back the power and the wealth and the income they had in 1929. And you can read about it. I mean, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all these, the Business Roundtable, all these organized forces came together and said, now we go on the offensive. They said, it will be a bitter pill for Americans to swallow to know that their lives must get worse so that business gets more. That was their program. It's still their program. Are we angry now? <laughs> well, this is uh, <coughs> the politics that happened. When they went on the offensive, they got government and they got the Supreme Court and so on to start making new rules and a rule in favor of employers in relations with unions. For example, Employers have freedom of speech, they said. That means when a union tries to form, the employer can do whatever they want to stop the union, as long as it's speech, right? They can't fire the people, but of course, uh, they do end up firing the people because by the time you take it to court, uh, the people have lost their job for two or three years. They're out of work, they found another job, they don't come back. And the freedom of speech meant that then they took workers, like let's say all of you were talking about forming a union, six the few of you were talking about it. When they hear that, they bring every one of you in for one-on-one -on -one meetings with your supervisor to say, now look, if you get involved in this union stuff, this company's gonna have to move. This company's gonna have to close. Not true. They just say it. But you get scared, right? I mean, it's your job, it's the way you live. They have forced meetings to tell people what it's going to be like with the union. The union can't do that. The union's not in the workplace. The union can only meet with people outside at a bar or you know, outside the gates. They can't meet with people like that. So all of a sudden, even when people start out with a majority of people saying, signing cards saying they want a union, by the time they have an election, only 30% vote for it. They've been scared out of it. So the amount of unions that are forming at a time when union shops are closing because of globalization and deindustrialization, no new unions are forming because they're being shut down by every means possible. And that means the union movement has declined very rapidly as a result. And now is only 10% of the workforce. And so, you know, this Mesa coincides with the great American middle class. The great American middle class went up like this and has been going down since then. Now the progressive taxation programs are very important too, but the, even the unions play a role in that because if you look at policy, when unions had 35% of the workforce, they had a lot of political power. I mean, that thing I passed around, I don't know how many of you got to see it, but it's about elections too, right? I mean, unions get involved in politics because it matters who's in the government. And so they were electing people who were in favor of progressive taxation. And they were electing people uh, who would be in favor of having community colleges or in favor of having universal health care, affordable health care for everybody. And that has no longer, you know, that's less and less the case. They have less and less people that they can mobilize and, and get involved in politics. So last year, a statistical thing happened with the labor movement. I don't know if any of you are aware of it. That's of really historic significance. Uh, bad news, because it gets worse. Does anybody know what happened? What statistical thing changed about the union movement? Who they represent? For the first time in American history, the labor movement represented more government workers than private sector workers. You know, it's already down to 10% of the workforce, and then half of that, half of it, over half, are government employees. And then, let's go a little further. I mean, 80% of all union workers are actually tax-funded. If you get a job as a social worker in a private group home, it's paid for with tax money. 
If you get a job working as a personal care attendant for an agency, taking care of the elderly or the disabled, it's funded by Medicaid. That's tax funded. If you're a construction worker building BCC or building a school or building a courthouse, most likely union jobs for construction workers, paid for with tax money, public money. 80% of union workers are government workers, essentially, even if they work for a private company. And that means, you remember that thing I said, the genius of the New Deal was to do half of the re sharing of the wealth through government, <coughs> progressive taxes, and half through, you know, private, you know, the private economy. Something huge has changed when 80% of the workers are government workers. That means they're paid for with the same progressive taxes that programs are paid for. In other words, we only have one half of our strategy left to share the wealth in this country, and that's really government. Even the union movement is basically government at this point. And that's, that's not politically a strong place to be, and it's why now the forces who are against equality, big corporations, wealthy investors, they're using all their political force now to go on a new offensive, like this one, which is to wipe out those government programs, wipe out public employees. So they're attacking public programs and public employees at the same time. You hear about it, right? I mean, public employees can't bargain anymore. Public employees shouldn't have union rights. And we shouldn't be spending tax money. We shouldn't tax wealthy people to fund Medicare, Social Security, public schools, public higher education. That's why they said, let the students pay for it. We can't afford to do that anymore, even though there's more wealth in this country than there has ever been before. Do you have any questions on uh, what I've said so far? Yes? Well, it's like the it's the funny way. I mean, uh, uh, as saying, you know, why do the bottom fifty percent have negative wealth and the top one percent have forty percent of the wealth? It's what we call distribution. It's a problem of distribution. I mean, if we were taxing people at a rate that was uh, fair uh, and appropriate, like we were when I was young, uh, we wouldn't have that debt. Under Clinton, Clinton raised taxes on the rich, and he wiped out the deficit. One of the ways he wiped it out was by raising taxes on the rich. It was the, you know, he didn't just do that, but he did that. And, and that's something that is always an option. The same, it's the same policy options are always there. I mean, you can say Social Security is out of money. Did you know that if you make over about $100,000 a year, you stop paying Social Security taxes altogether? That's not even a flat tax in the sense of 10%, 10% or whatever. That's a regressive tax. If you make over 100000 if you make a million dollars, you only pay Social Security on the first $100,000, and then you pay nothing on the other $900,000. And so one would wonder why Social Security is a little bit of trouble. That's worth a lot of money to Social Security. In fact, uh, based on what I saw in this state when people you know, used it, applied it to something in this state, when you cut everybody off at that Social Security cutoff, it cut the revenue of a tax in half. <laughs> in half for the health care reform that we were doing. We said, let's tax employee, you know, like have a payroll tax. And they said, well, let's use the Social Security cutoff. The revenue went from $750 million to $350 million like that. I, I blew me away. I had no idea <laughs> it was that much of it. So if you even like raised it a little bit, it would deal with the Social Security problem. You know, even if you raise taxes on the rich, not to 91%, but to 40%, most of that debt would start to go down like this. So is that $14 trillion debt then caused by the fact that 90% of the population is older or at the moment? Well, yeah, the more regressive you make the taxes and the more rich the top group get, the less taxes you collect no matter how high the rate is. Because there's less money at the bottom and you're taxing them even maybe more, it doesn't get you that much more. 
whereas the money's all concentrated at the top. And you could say, well, those are supposed, you know, what do the right wing people say? So those are the job creators, right? Well, why aren't they creating the jobs? Because it's not profitable to them to create the jobs. They'd rather keep the money or use it overseas or whatever. So we have to go back for that, you know, and, and try to do that. Now, the situation with the debt got very bad, not with Obama, even with the recession. That already was true with George Bush because he cut taxes for the rich. Everybody said that was going to be a huge increase in the deficit and debt. And he started two wars, which are incredibly expensive. So we have wars that, and we cut the way to pay for them. So you have higher expenses and lower revenue. And it, it's a disaster. I'm going to push tax cuts, extend them if he knew that this is going to increase the deficit, which he's already getting hammered for, even though it's not entirely his fault. Well, if he wasn't the best option we have for president, I would really say some nasty things about him about that because he should have done that. He should have expired. I mean, the one thing I know he should have done is expired the Bush tax cuts. Could have done it. He had the majority still. And it would have helped with this deficit problem more than everything this super committee or any of these other people are talking about doing. Um, lost opportunity. We aren't doing nothing, but, but we do have a disadvantage. What, the people who decided we need to get rid of unions and we need to get rid of progressive taxation, what did they have, what's the main tool they had to get their message out? Money. Money. They could buy media, right? They could buy politicians. I mean, they could buy think tanks and, uh, and research groups to put out papers. They could do all this stuff and get their message out with the power of money. So we do it with the power of people. And I'm not saying that's a weak thing. It, it happened in 1935. It can happen again. 1935, unions were weak. Okay? In 1935, the people were poor and weak. But they weren't weak because they did something. They rose up. They said, we need something or things are going to fall apart. We, it's sort of like the Occupy movement, but imagine it on a much bigger scale, right? So, I mean, what does the union movement do? I mean, we're trying to organize more private sector workers. I mean, that's what we have to do. We can't organize, I mean, we can organize more public sector workers, but that's just more of the big government, right? We need to organize private sector workers and get them back into the American dream, back into the middle class. And we're doing that by going after sectors that can't be sent offshore, you know, they can't, their jobs can't be sent away to another country. They can't be just taken away by robots, you know, like in an auto factory where almost everything's done by machines now. They're jobs like service jobs, like weatherization. We could be, you know, we need to get off our oil dependency. What are we doing about it? We could be hiring inner city workers who are unemployed, inner city youth who don't have jobs, and training them to do weatherization. It's a good job. It could be a union job, right? That hasn't happened. That was a big disappointment, too. We thought that was going to happen with the new president. Um, we can organize business services, FedEx, call centers, you know, that do all this calling to hassle people about their bills. Those are all non-union. They could be all union. Uh, cleaning crews and security, we've already started to unionize. Um, we can do retail and fast food. What about all these people working in Walmarts and uh, McDonald's and Burger Kings? I mean, these people should have a union. They're the lowest paid people. They get treated terribly. They should have unions. Banking and finance. You know what bank tellers make in this country? You know, they wear a, a suit to work sometimes or a tie. They get paid $11, $12 an hour, no benefits. We met with Brazilian bank workers who have a union. All the u bank workers in Brazil are in a union. Brazil, right? I mean, it's a third world country. They made more money in wages and benefits than the bank tellers in Boston made. They had child care, they had health care, they had a retirement, and they had a living wage for Brazil. So, you know, this is the people, who, and we've interviewed bank workers, they want to be in a union. But, you know, it's hard because I told you, this, the, the thing is set against the union situation. I mean, employers threaten people. We worked with a bank worker who went public about the bank's practices, and they fired him, even though the year before he had won the award 
for Sovereign Bank as the best employee of the year. They fired him the next year because he went public saying he wanted a union. So we do things, you know, to fight back. We shame corporations if we can. We go public too in the media and say, Bay State Hospital in Springfield is laying off 350 people. They're doing it just to up their profit rate. You know, we show the statistics, we prove it, and they get so embarrassed that they have to backtrack. You know, we turn the community against the employer by showing the bad practices they have, and that way the community supports the union. Or we say, let's have a master contract. If you have a bunch of cleaning companies, right? You organize one cleaning company to clean buildings, the next day they go out of business because all the others undercut them, right? So what we did in Boston was we didn't organize a single cleaner into an official union until every company was unionized. And then we declared one contract for all companies so that none was undercutting any other. You know, that's a strategy we had to come up with because the odds are stacked against us. But we're doing those things. And like that thing I handed around, you know, this brochure, we're also signing people up who are not union members to be part of the union. So if you're out of work, if you're a worker in a non-union shop, you can still be a member of SEIU. We signed up 2,500 members in Springfield this uh, fall alone. And that's because people want to be part of something bigger and stronger. We work in coalition with other community groups, like uh, here you, know, you have the Coalition for Social Justice in, in this area. We work together to fight for the same things. So you know, getting involved is key. I mean, that's how it happened in 1935. It wasn't you know, like something rained down from the heavens. People rose up and said, this is intolerable. And when they changed it, they changed it so it not only you know, got better, but it actually changed the power structure of America, it built a middle class that was the majority of the country for the first time. And now we're in danger of losing that. We have to get back on it. So, uh, you know, what can you do? I mean, you know, you need, okay, you need, I mean, you need to be able to get involved yourselves. I mean, you can get involved as private people in organizations or just confronting your elected officials and saying things like this super committee that's deciding what are we going to cut? As we said, you know, there's a deficit and a debt, but what are we going to cut? Or what taxes are we going to raise? This is all on the table, right? Well, they say, well, maybe we should cut Medicaid, you know? I mean, if you know Medicaid, Medicaid provides health care to a mi over a million people in Massachusetts who could not afford to see a doctor otherwise. I mean, why you would cut that at a time of high unemployment, it's just cruel. I mean, then you're saying, well, uh, I guess some people won't get medical care. I mean, so we're making decisions that don't make sense. I mean, why don't we cut some of the military spending we're spending on wars that we're wrapping up? You know, that should save us some money. There are weapons programs we don't need. Why don't we raise taxes on the wealthy again, just to the level they were under Bill Clinton? That would deal with a lot of it. You know, the super committee doesn't talk that way. You know, the people in Congress don't talk that way. They're, the majority there is part of this onslaught that is, wants to erase the New Deal, the public programs. They want Medicare to end. They want Medicaid to end. They want Social Security to end. They want public education to end. That sounds crazy to me. I can't believe there's powerful people in control of our government who want to end the things that made you know, my life possible, you know, to make all of our lives possible. I, it's just inconceivable, but that's how big a crisis we're in right now. And so the chair of that committee for the whole country is John Kerry, your U.S. Senator, a Democrat, no liberal, not a bad person, but, you know, his job is to find a way to make a compromise with these people who want to eliminate these things. Remind him <laughs> that don't compromise with things that are about people's survival. You know, make a deal, but make a deal that focuses on what we should be doing, like dealing with the inequality in this country rather than hurting the people who are already down. Uh, and Scott Brown is your other U.S. Senator, and frankly, he's on the side of greater inequality. He says we tax wealthy people too much, you know. He says we should cut taxes for the wealthy so they'll create more jobs even though they already have 40% of the wealth and they're not creating more jobs, if we give them even more of the wealth, then maybe, maybe they'll decide to create some jobs. Uh, 
Meanwhile, you cut Medicaid and Medicare, and you're cutting a huge number of jobs in Massachusetts. It's the biggest part of our economy. It's the most stable part of our economy. And people work for the hospitals and uh, Medicaid. So you could do that. You can also get involved in Massachusetts. We're trying to make sure we want to reform the tax code so it raises more money, but does it mainly from people who can afford to pay more. Because even in this state, if you're a normal person, like a middle class person, you pay about 10% of your income in state and local taxes. Not federal, but state and local. It's 10% of your income. If you're in the top 1% in Massachusetts, you pay 5% of your income in state and local taxes. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. I mean, we're not taxing you know, the income of wealthy people at the same rate we're taxing middle class people and working people. So you can get involved in that. There, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I mean, there are ways to get involved right here in Bristol County, right here in Fall River. So, and again, when you hear about public workers you know, making too much money or getting too much health care, don't join the attack. Defend them, because they are not making too much. They're making what every worker should make. They have retirement security like every worker should have. They have health benefits like every worker should have, like every union worker used to have when I was a kid. I mean, they're attacking people who just have what we used to think was like the bare necessities of a middle class life. And we're attacking those folks. So anyway, lots of things you can do about it. Uh, you know, so I mean, don't, you know, have hope, but it's got to come from the bottom up. It's not coming, I mean, Obama was the best choice for president, I think, but he can't do it. Even Roosevelt said, I did what I did because the people made me do it. You know, that's what democracy is. So, uh, any questions before we break up? Let me just uh, step in for one second. Uh, one thing is make sure that you pass out your, in your evaluation form when you leave. And secondly, I do want to repeat what Harris just said about the importance of getting involved. And there are organizations locally. I personally work with Coalition for Social Justice. A lot of other people at BCC do too. They accomplish a lot. Uh, so if you're interested in being involved, if you're interested in calling Senator Kerry, I have a flyer with a number on it, and you can grab that and make that call. Uh, but ultimately, how many people here get involved and how many of the American people get involved to fight back is going to determine whether we make any progress on these issues or whether it just continues to get worse. And let's uh, give a big round of applause for Harris Truman.